Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful summer weekend. Um, we had a lot of feedback from last week's call and the previous, I think two or three weeks ago's call about uh, objections, and we didn't quite get to the very end of that, and people wanted to know how we um, uh, turn the corner once we get on their side. So this is part three, uh, the last part of how we overcome objection. So remember the objection template is we acknowledge their objection if they say, um, uh, we don't like to pay fees to advisors. Say absolutely, or uh, um, uh, there's lots of anything that tells them 100%. So right on, you're exactly right. 100% agree. Whatever we want to say, we acknowledge our objection. We compare it back in the form of a question. We say, I mean, why we wouldn't want to be paying fees to advisors, would we? So we pair it back in the form of a question. Then we get on the client side for at least three minutes, and we talk about that. And then we say, and because once we tell them they're right. We have to have them understand there's a different a way to think about things. So then we ask open-ended questions to get them to tell us why the way they're thinking doesn't apply in this case. So that's how, you know, a lot of people said, well, how do you do that though? What, I mean, once you tell them that they're right, 100% right, 110% right, 150% right, how do you turn that corner? How do you then get them to tell you why uh, they should move forward? Now I just touched on it, I think for one or two minutes last time. So we had a lot of people, interested in how we do that because people say what about turning that corner well the first thing i want to talk about is do you think it takes a lot of skill level or very low skill level to be able to to, to do the overcome objections the way i'm showing you to do this does it take a lot of skill level or a little skill level <clears throat> a lot that's right so but there is a way to use this as a beginner and it still works extremely well so it's the same template. Template can can everybody on the call acknowledge somebody's objection? Can you say absolutely or you're right or 100% agree? Can everybody do that? Yes. Can everybody then pair it back in the form of a question just by adding, isn't it? Wouldn't it? Couldn't it? Shouldn't it? Could you just add? You basically repeat back what they say and isn't it? So if they say so, 100% of you can do that. This takes a little bit of work, but do you see last week? Did did we learn that we can just take out a piece of paper? and start listing all the reasons what they said was valid. Can everybody do that? Just pull out a piece of paper and spend three minutes telling everybody they're right. I mean, you saw Tom and Nick do it last week and he, they had no clue what was, what was uh, going to be thrown at them. Because remember, I let you choose the objection and were they able to do that? And they're the first to, to tell you that they're not experts on this. So they uh, were able to do that. So that's easy to do. Is using and instead of but easy. Yes, but this is where it requires skill. You gotta think on your feet and use motivational interviewing on your feet, asking open-ended questions on your feet to have them move forward. This is, a, this is the one that requires skill. These do not require skill. Within one day, you could become an expert on these. One day, you could become an expert on these. This, though, requires thinking on the feet, so that's a much more difficult thing. That requires skill. So what if we did not do that, but instead, we acknowledge our objection, pair it back in the form of question, get on the client's side for at least three minutes, Use the word and instead of but, and then just simply do it the way you always did it. And even, you could even use the word but. You could even screw up number four and say, but, so tell them why they're right for three minutes, and then say, but, and then overcome the objection the, uh, the way you always overcome them. What if you did it that way? So remember, first of all, though, I just want to repeat this. Why do we need to go for three, uh, three to five minutes? Why do we take so long there? Why do we get on their side for at least three minutes, three to five minutes? Why do we do that? That's right. So they forget the objection. Very good. Very good, Dale. Yep. So that, that's right, Tom. So we, we're creating real estate between when they give us the objection and when we overcome it so they don't have to admit that they're what? Wrong. Nobody wants to admit that they're wrong. So we're going to tell them they're right. We're going to climb into their head because people like people just like themselves. You like people just like you. So when you tell them they're right, tell them that you think the way they think, they like you right away. So when we acknowledge your objection, pair it back in the form of a question, get on the client side for at least three minutes, and use the word and, but not but. And again, I'm making a point here. You could even make a mistake here and use the word but. You can always do it the way you always, you can just do it the way I always did. But what would happen? What would happen if you acknowledge it, they gave you an objection, you acknowledge it, you pair it back in the form of a question, 
get on their side for three minutes, and you were, use the word but, and then overcome it the way you always do, you say, but can I just share one thing with you? So if they said, um, I don't like to pay advisor's fees, you get on their side, you, you say, absolutely. I mean, why would you, we wouldn't want to be paying advisor's fees, would we, when, when there's free information out there, would we? And they say, yeah, no. And so they're, now they're agreeing with us. And then we get on the client's side for three minutes and say, explain why that's the case. And remember, we did that last week. And then I say, but can I just share one thing with you? Better yet, say, and can I just share one thing with you? But what if you said, but can I just share one thing with you? What's the difference between doing it that way? What's the difference now when you overcome the objection? If you do these four things first, or these, first, these three things first, what's the difference between how you overcome it and doing these three things first? Instead of saying, hey, you used to know, you know I've, I've, uh, I understand how you feel. I used to feel that same way myself. What I found is blah, 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 blah. What's the difference between doing, it, doing these three things before you overcome the objection? What's the difference? Okay, uh, uh, Dale says they think they're coming from where they are. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You're not telling them they're wrong, that they just may not uh, have a, not have all the information. Well, I don't want to, if I, if, um, I see why you would say that, but I don't want to, um, I certainly want to say that you're telling them they're not wrong, but I don't want to imply that they don't have all the information. Because if, if I imply that, I'm, then I am saying they're what? Yeah, I don't want to say that they're wrong. So instead, what I'm doing, by, when I get on their side, when I get on their side for three to five minutes and tell them they're right, how are they feeling about me? We're talking about, here's the six principles of influence, reciprocity, consistency, social proof, authority, liking, and scarcity. These are right from Cialdini, six principles of influence. When I tell them they're right, and I, I just gave you the answer not five minutes ago, when I tell them they're right and spend three to five minutes telling them they're right, what happens to them and how they feel about me? They start to what? Guys, they do what? Yes. So is that part of one of the six principles of influence? Yes. So now they like me. They like me. Also, did I spend three, if I spent three to five minutes talking about why they're right, when I say, and, or, but, can I just share one thing with you? What other principle of influence are we tapping into? So now they like us, but we're also tapping into one thing. Quid pro quo. So which one of these principles? There we go. Reciprocity. So we've, we've, listed, we've told them why they're right for three to five minutes, but can I share with you another way of looking at things? They think, well, he agreed with me. I can at least what? Spend a minute listening to what he has to say. Do you see how that works? So we're using, there's six principles of influence. We're using two of them. That means we're using one third of the principles of influence by doing those three things first. So could everybody actually do overcome objective, even if you're not an expert at overcoming their, uh, uh, at um, using motivational leading and open-ended questions. Could everybody do this part? One, two, three, use either word, the word and, which is better, or but, which is okay, and then just do it the way, the way you always did. So even if you do it that way, you're, it, there's a huge difference in that, that now they like you and they're willing to listen to you because you, you were willing to argue their point of view. Does that make sense? Is anybody confused? Could everybody on the call do that? Could everybody, I want all to say yay or nay on that. Yeah, everybody can do that. And is this the way that you were trained originally and the, all the other advisors are not with 5Q? Is this the way they're trained? Or are they trained to do it the old school way? And does the old school, we went through that here a, a few weeks ago, does the old school way of overcoming objections work? No. People are way, 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 way too sophisticated for that. So you can do it the way that we just did, and it still works. It still works. 
So even if you're a beginner, you can use this way of overcoming objections. But a lot of people want to say, okay, okay, I, I get that. Thank you. But I'd like to know, how do you overcome, how do you overcome the objections the way in an expert way? If I want to become perfect at overcoming objections, how would I do that? First of all, I just want to go back here a second. What's the best way? This is from, uh, again, three or four weeks ago. What's the best way to overcome an objection? What's the best way to overcome an objection? Yeah, not to get one. You overcome it before they even bring it up. And that's what our scripts are designed to do. But uh, it, let's say that uh, uh, everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. So, uh, And you do that, and then you get an objection. If you want to do it like an expert, remember what the, the objection you guys gave us last week was, I don't like to pay for financial advice. Does that, did we all rem recall that? So, again, the objection template is to what? Acknowledge your objection. Absolutely. We wouldn't want to be paying for, uh, you know, fees for financial advice when it's, there's all sorts of information out there for free, would we? No, we wouldn't. Now, remember we said, is it okay if they say no? Because we've been told, got to get them saying yes, got to get them saying yes, got to get them saying yes. Is it okay if we get them to say no here? Say, yes, and Nick says, yes, it is okay. And why is that okay to get them to say no there? The point with number two is what? To get them from arguing with me to what? What's number two? To agree with me. So I don't care if, as long as they agree with my question, then I'm good. And then I get on their side for at least three minutes. Then I use the word and or but, and I have them, uh, I'm sorry, use the word and, not but, and then I'm gonna use open-ended questions to, to um, get them to tell me why they should move forward. So again, this is the, this is the most important thing to get, get on their side for three minutes because then it, it makes it work whether you do it your old way or the more effective way it still works if you spend the three minutes doing this now this is right from last week remember that that uh, uh, Tom and Nick came up with nobody knows my situation better than me that's why they said I, I don't think I should be paying for finan uh, financial advice because nobody pays a situation for knows my situation better than me I don't get value from what I'm for what I'm paying all they want to do is make money on their advice. Tons of great free information out there. And then we broke it down even further. When somebody says, nobody knows my situation better than me, we said, you haven't known me that long. I'm a private person. I'm not your average bear. My situation is in flux. Or uh, if we go with the uh, number two here, I don't get value for what I'm paying. We say all of the advisors ask for way too much money. I'm not sure how to justify the value I'm receiving. Or if we went with all you want to do is make money, that's all they ever, the advisor ever want to talk about. How many assets do I have? Everybody's in it for themselves. They never offer investments that are free to me. They never tell me what's actually. So guys, would it be possible, again, you can write this out right in front of them to, to get on their side and explain why what they said was completely valid for three to five minutes. In fact, we said we could go on how long covering all these things? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes if we wanted, but we don't need to. We just need to go three to five minutes so they forget why we're even talking about this, so they don't need to admit that they're wrong. So, okay, so we, we did this last week. So again, acknowledge your objection, pair it back in the form of a question, get on the client side, use and, and then we uh, to have them tell us why they should move forward. So this is the one where a lot of people said, well, how do you do that? Because there's panic. A lot of you guys panic here about, but if I tell them for three to five minutes that they're right, what do you panic about? Why are so many advisors afraid to use this objection template, even though it's way more effective than any other way to overcome objections? They're afraid because why? You just spent three to five minutes telling them what? You just spent three to five minutes telling them that they're what? Kind of right? Yeah, right, kind of right or right, right? That's right, Artie, right, right. And did we use, uh, I could see why you, why you would think that, or did we use the word probably, or sometimes, or that can occur? If I use that language, I call that qualifying language. What are you doing when you use that kind of language? Yeah, you gotta be absolute, it's gotta be absolute. Do you see anything in here where I'm qualifying, or do I say nobody? Not, sometimes uh, people don't know your, uh, uh, you know, some people wouldn't know your situation better than you. No, I said nobody knows your situation better than you. I'm a private person. I'm an average bear. You know, you, uh, um, 
you know, you're mostly an average bear. You know, you mostly, uh, uh, or mostly you're not an average bear. Or you're, you're not like most people. No, I'm saying you're not like what? Do I say you're not like most people? No, by this I'm saying what? You're not like what? And that's right, anyone. Uh, my situation is in flux. You know, your, your situation may be, may be uh, you know, in flux. Do I say that or do I say, no, your situation is. Is it maybe or is? Do you see how this is all black and white? And so advisors start to be afraid that, well, if I tell them all these things, I can't what? If I tell them all these things, how could I ever, ever, ever overcome that objection? Yeah, how do I turn that corner? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Again, you don't need to worry about this. Do it the way you've always done it, as long as you do these three things first, and you'll be just fine. But a lot of people wanted, wanted to know, well, how do you turn that corner if you want to learn that? So let's talk about how you do that. You ask who, what, where, why, when, and how questions. If you want to know how to do that, you'd go to, on the website, you go to implementation, you just type in, um, uh, or go to implementation meeting, handling objections, or you can just type in here, handling objections. Either way, you know, bring you to the right place. And then in that handling objections, there's a, there's a uh, form or a uh, cheat sheet called bottom lines. So if we go there, these are the bottom lines. So these are all the objections that advisors can get. What, can, what do, can clients say, does this have high fees? Has anybody on the call ever heard somebody say, does this have high fees or some form of that? How about, I don't want to be in anything risky. I don't want to pay high fees. I want to see everything in writing. Can I sleep on this? Have you ever heard those things? But what if the stock market goes up? I don't want to miss out. What if something happens to you? If you're a, if you're a sole proprietor, do you ever get that? If you're a sole proprietor, if I move my money to you and I trust you, what happens if something happens to you? I used to get that all the time. I'm going to be, uh, can I review this with my accountant? Can I review this with my son? My neighbor says this isn't any good, or my friend, or my brother, or my workmate says this isn't any good. I want to shop around. I'm going to wait till everything settles down. My broker says that everything is going to go back up. I don't want to lose the death benefit. I, I want to, uh, if I pull out, I'm going to get hit with a big tax bill, surrender or penalty. My children said I just uh, should leave everything as is. I'm not just, I'm just not sure. I'm going to wait until I get my next statement. Can I, get, can I just give you a try, a try with $10,000 and see how it goes? Guys, have you heard these things before? I want to fix all the legal problems and titling first, then we can talk about the investments. Can I just pay you by the hour to help us with some of these things? Can I just pay a planner hourly to fix these things? Can I handle my investments myself? I want to get started to all my, uh, uh, on my own right now. Can I take the survivor's guide with me? Can I take the quality of life directive with me? Do I have, do you think I should leave my broker? I want to stay with my broker. Is this liquid? Uh, I heard some investments lock up your investments for many years. What if I need my money? Guys, is this a very, uh, uh, how many other objections do you get other than these? Or have we pretty much got 95% uh, uh, of the objections you get? Is there a lot, are we missing a lot of objections? Do we have most of the objections here, guys? Most, yes, we have most. So the one that we got last week was a, a, um, a version of, I don't want to pay high fees, because the, the objection you guys came up with last night, or through it, or last, last Monday was, um, I, I don't think I should be paying for financial advice. Can we agree that's similar to, I don't want to pay high fees? Can we agree that? So when you do the first four things, acknowledge, exactly, pair it back and form a question. Why would we want to be, we wouldn't want to be paying fees when we get information free, would we? No. And then we uh, get on their side and we just walk through the whole laundry list of how we got on their side. And they say, and if we think about it, or and, um, uh, uh, you can just go right into the who, what, where, why, when, how. And that's the way we conduct ourselves in real life. And, and you know, whatever you want to do, you can say, and. But the things I'm going to try to ask open-ended questions to get them agree with is that fees are lower. The fees um, on what I'm recommending is lower than the fees you're currently paying. Or 
you don't mind paying fees as long as you're getting something for it. Guys, is there anybody that you're going to come across that, that would say, uh, if we can get them to finally find out that the fees we're paying are lower than the fees they're currently paying, how many people are going to argue with that? If they truly want low fees, which one do they want? Do they really care whether it's the one they have now or the one I'm recommending? If they really want low fees, they're going to choose the one what? The one they have now or the one they're recommending? They're going to recommend the one that has what? Less fees. So all I need to do is have them discover that what I'm recommending has less fees. So that's the first way I could go. See, there's two different ways. You don't do both of these. You grab one track or you grab the other track. So in this track, I'm, uh, the second track is, you don't mind paying uh, as long as you get, you know, you're getting something for it. Does anybody mind paying a fee as long as they get something for it? No, nobody minds that. So how could we go along with that? How could we use that? If I get back here to my... So let's ask some who, what, where, why, how questions. And again, we can go to two different ways. One way is we could go, if we're showing, if they, would, if they say that they don't like high fees and they believe that the FIA has, uh, FIA has high fees, we can go with the FIA presentation where they find out it has fairer fees and is more liquid than a money management no load fund. Guys, does our, our um, FIA presentation show that it has fairer fees than mutual funds, VAs, money management, uh, even banks, does it show it has fairer fees than all of those things? Because I say so or because the client says so? How many times does the client say in our presentation that an FIA has fairer fees than money management or has fairer fees than a variable annuity or has fairer fees than anything? Many, many times. How many times does they say it's more liquid than money management? And this is where a lot of guys, guys, uh, who else out there could show you that uh, – give you a presentation that an FIA with a seven-year or a 10-year uh, hold period with a – beginning with a 10% penalty is more liquid than money management? Is there any other FMO, sales coach, et cetera, that can give you a presentation where a client's going to say that – not you say it. The client's going to say – seven, eight, nine, ten times that the FIA that's a 10-year hold with a 10% penalty is more liquid than money management. So I've only got two guys agreeing with that. Is there anybody else going to show you that? So now i got three answers. Okay, everybody's answering now. Okay, good. And if they agree with that, then what? If they're worried about fees, what if they just agreed? But the FIA is better. See, money, also, <laughs> they're worried about the commission. We have a way to overcome that by having money management cost more than a commission. So do you all know how to do this? Money management costs more than a commission. Do you all know how to do this? Is there anybody else out there in the world, sales coach, FMO, whatever, can have you have a client tell you that money management costs more than commission? Is there anybody out there? So how do we do that? Well, what we do there is this. So Jeff, can you get on the line? I just want to show you how to do that. So first of all, I would agree, get on their side, tell them for three minutes that they're right, and then I use the word and. So are you on, Jeff? Yep, I'm here. So I've done all those things. You then say, and you know, have you ever bought a house or sold a house, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I've done that a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, and do real estate agents work for free? No, they don't. No, they, they charge a what? Uh, commission. Commission. So let's say they, they say, hey, I don't, you know, you tell them I don't like a commission. What if they did this instead? What if they said, okay, well, I do, just so you know, I do have two ways of paying a commission. So you're selling your house, let's just say, for a million dollars. So just as round numbers. You're selling your house for a million dollars. So you could pay me one of two ways. You could pay me a 7% a commission up front. Or you could pay me a 1% commission every year for as long as you own your house. So let me ask you a question. When you buy a house, how long do you plan on holding it? Uh, 15, One year, two years, years five years, 15, 10 years? years? 
15, 20 years. So they say, so Jeff, you can pay me 7% upfront on a million or 1% a year every year going forward. Now, do you hope your house goes down in value, stays the same in value, or goes up in value? Well, I hope it goes up. Yeah. So again, <laughs> you're going to hold it for 20 years, you said, and you hope it does what in value? It goes up in value. Yeah. So if we think about this logically, they give you the choice between paying 7% upfront, which means you pay what? I pay $70,000. $70,000. That's what? That's a lot. A little or a lot? A lot. Yeah. So they say, well, we do have a different way to do it. So do you have a pen and paper there, Jeff? Uh, yep. So they say what we can do, and you know, and what would you say is a normal increase in in home values on a yearly basis? What would you expect? Uh, and guys, when you ask them that, do they choose low or high generally? When you ask them whether something's going to go, they own is going to go up. Do they usually say it's going to be a high amount or a low amount? Yeah, they usually say high. So don't go crazy, Jeff. But you know, so what do you think, Jeff? Um, your house should go up on average as you own it. Five percent. Five percent. Okay. Well, let's look at this then. Let's let's take your million dollars. I have to do it right. So we've got a calculator here. I got a million dollars, and so mm -hmm. the first year, write down uh, what what's one percent because that's what management fees, uh, money management fees. One percent. First of all, guys, am I being generous when I say money management fees are only going to be one percent? Because money managers generally are going to charge one per, you know whatever themselves, and then you have to make your profit, so you're going to charge above that. So am I being generous if I say one percent? Or is are, when they add what the money manager and what you're going to get paid as a as as a liaison is going to be more. So so we're going to even give the benefit of the doubt here to Jeff. So it, so um, what's one percent of a million, Jeff? Uh, ten thousand. Ten thousand. One. Uh, oops. So ten thousand. So write down ten thousand. Okay. Times one point zero. I'm sorry, what did I say? One percent you said the your house isn't gonna go one percent, it's gonna go up what again? About five percent. Five percent. So we'd write down um five thousand. Or uh, so what's five percent of a million? Uh five percent of a million? Fifty thousand. Yeah. Fifty thousand. So your house goes up to hundred and fifty thousand and you're gonna be charged one point zero one or, or um one point zero one or or one percent on that. So that means you're going to pay how much that at the end of the second year? Uh, ten thousand five hundred. Yep. Yeah. And then the next year goes up five percent, so times one point zero five, and that means you're going to pay how much the next year? Uh, Eleven thousand twenty-five. Yep. And then it goes up by five percent. Uh, Eleven thousand five seventy-six. And now, how many years are we at right now? Four. Four, okay. Times 1.05. Uh, 12, and what's the, what are you going to pay the next year? Uh, 12,155. Times one point. Guys, I'm going to do this until what? How long before he's going to hit that 70 grand? So if you think about it then, Jeff, after 20 years, how much money will you have paid for commission? Oh, wow, probably about $300,000. Yeah. So if you're going to pay commission, you want to pay on a smaller amount or on a bigger amount? Oh, on a smaller amount. So is your house going to be valued the least, amount, hopefully, the least now or the least 20 years from now and every year in between? Uh, the least now. Yeah. So we'd all prefer to pay what if we could get by with it? No, we'd all prefer to pay Zero. nothing. <laughs> Zero, right? But that's right. not an option. So right now you're paying 1% a year on what your account is valued. And I'm, and I'm offering a commission one time on a, on a smaller amount or on a larger amount as compared to what will be in the amount. future. Smaller yeah, amount. Yeah, a 7%. And again, you said you're going to hold this for how long? One or two years or are you going to hold this for many years? Uh, many years. Yeah. So if you leave it in the money management versus put it in the FIA, every year that goes by, you're being rewarded or penalized by the way you're paying? Oh, we're being penalized. Yeah. So what is a fair – hey, you know what? 
everything has advantages and disadvantages, but if you really want to talk about what is the fairer way to pay, which way is, is better, money management or a commission? Or the commission. Guys, did I force Jeff to say that? Would, what, what would clients say? When you walk through the math like that, which, really, if you walk through the math, which way is better? How many of you guys would sell your house that way? Well, instead of paying a commission, you would sell your house at 1% a year for as long as you hold that house based on the house value. How many of you would do that? How many of you do? I got one person that says not me. Really? How many of you would do that? Yeah, nobody would ever do that. Nobody would ever do that. If you can do math, and guys, can they do math in their head or do you have to walk through the math just like it is with Jeff right there? And I know it's hard on the phone, but um, you walk through, nobody's, <laughs> so money management costs more. You know, 1% a year, fee-based. Now, if they're going to charge hourly, that's fine. Hourly is by far the cheapest. How many of you charge hourly? How many of your competitors charge hourly? No. You're running into what? When you're competing with money managers, it's people charging a fee. And heck, if I had made that 2%, how quickly would you, Jeff, have, would we have uh, <laughs> hit the threshold? Which is more uh, likely what people are charging money manager-wise. Yeah, we would have. So do you see how – I'm sorry, Jeff. Sorry. Yeah. No, we would have hit it quicker. Yeah, much quicker. So that – which way is a better way to charge fees? Now, as far as money management being, or FIs being more liquid than a money management, does anybody know the key to that? I won't go through the whole script because it's in the, the actual presentation, the FI presentation on the website. But what is the key to having the client tell you in no uncertain terms several times that FIAs are more liquid than money management? Yeah, so the market can lose 1% or 2% in any particular day. So the market can go down, FI can't go, can't go down. So, yeah, if, if you don't know how to do that, walk through the presentation. I, and I get the client to tell me many times over that FIAs are more liquid than money management. What I went through here is that FIAs commissions are better than money management fee-based. And, guys, does anybody, if you don't believe that, please, 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 I'll make a bet with you. I'll give you 50000 if you give me 1000 if you put me in front of your client and let me do this presentation in front of them. And we'll find out which way, if you've got money management, which way is a better way to pay a fee. Does anybody want me to walk through that analogy with your money management clients? Are you, are you so confident that the way you, the money managers charge fees that are so great that you would do that bet, 50 grand to one? Why am I confident, that confident, that I give you 50000 to your 1000 Because I know that, that would work with how many people. Now, am I saying, Jeff, that money, man, uh, money management fees are a bad thing? No. So what am I saying then? That the uh, FIA is just more fair. Yeah. So, guys, could I sell money management after I did the FIA? I'd say... Yes, because uh, – um, and, guys, if you really want to do an FIA fee-based, you could do that, right? Are there FIAs out there that are uh, – there's a place for both, Tom. That's the, that's the, there is a place for both. You always hedge your bets. So you're never saying something's bad. You're just saying, listen, you've been showing the good things because what – how many money managers, how many fee-based are saying commissions are good? They all say what? 100% of people who do money management say commissions are what? Fisher says what? Please, please, please put me in front of any Fisher client. What's going to happen to that client? Put me in front of any Fisher client. What's going to happen to that client? So, guys, it's not that commissions are bad. It's not that um, uh, uh, fee base is bad. And you know what? Are there problems with hourly? Hell yeah, there's problems with hourly. Do you think I could do the same, the same thing that I did here with an hourly, somebody who charges hourly? Yes. So am I saying hourly is bad? Am I saying commissions are bad? Am I saying uh, fee base is bad? No, what I'm saying is what? They all have what and they all have what? 
They all have good and they all have bad. That's right. They all have advantages. They all have disadvantages. But people who only do money management only talk about what? what? Like Fisher only talked about what? The pros. Hey, we do better when you do better. Okay, yeah, that's half of it. What's the other half? You're charging me for the whole freaking rest of my life. <laughs> and, and you don't cover my losses when I go down. So do you see, see what I'm saying there? So the other way you could go is, are you worried about paying fees or net fees after saving? What I'm saying there is, saving money or paying fees more important? So let's say that I want to buy a, uh, I want to buy a, a, a top of the line car, and I go to it, and somebody says, "Listen, I'll find you a top of the line car, and I'm going to charge you." seven thousand dollars to do it would you do that guys i'll find you a top of the line car that you're looking for for seven grand would you do that yeah right Artie. i wouldn't either until okay now he says i'll charge you seven thousand dollars and then you find out by uh, talking to other people or through what he's shown you or talking to some of the retailers that if you actually save 15 grand by going through him, which means you net what? He's charging you seven, you save 15 grand. So what's your net? You net eight. So what would you say to somebody who said, well, I'm not gonna charge, I'm not gonna uh, charge a fee, or pay that guy seven, you know, 7% 7 fee or $70,000 in fee. What would you say to that person? Don't be a what? It's the bottom right, it's line, right. Don't be a fool. So are we really worried about paying fees or are we worried about our net savings after the fees are paid? So guys, with, when you do a 21 point checklist, Jeff, you do a lot of these for the guys. What's the, when we look at every single thing from turnover to management fees, unnecessary fees to the tax savings, when we look at everything, what's the average client seeing in savings? I'd say, High two thousands, low three thousands in fees, or of thirty one, thirty three hundred dollars in fees. And that's for turnover and everything involved. Yep. Bigger the account, that's for a three four hundred thousand dollar account, which is what I would say most people are running into. The bigger the account, the more the savings. Well, think about. Let's think about this. Let's say it's four hundred thousand, and mm -hmm. about how much in um, management, man, unnecessary management fees, meaning that. Um, uh, like uh, insurance costs and fees that they're paying that they could have just gotten from this. Guys, let me ask you a question. If, if that money manager is performing over the last five years less than, less than the S&P 500, is that unnecessary fee? So that if you look at the risk reward on that $400,000 account, you look at the risk reward and they're, um, Below that diagonal line we draw, are those unnecessary fees? Yes or no? Okay, everybody's saying yes. Because they could, just like we said with the, uh, just like they said with the, um, the cable story, right? The cable TV story. Why would you want to pay a fee if you could get the same thing or better for free? So are those fees unnecessary, guys? Yes. So what, give me a fee, give me, a man, give me an average fee. I don't care if it's a variable annuity or a combination of variable annuity and managed money. Variable annuity, managed money, what's an average, come give me a number of an average fee. And we got some people saying all the way up to three. Let's just say two. So what's 2% of 400,000, guys? Okay, eight thousand, eight percent, eight thousand dollars. Okay, now Jeff, what's the average turnover that you see? I'd say around fifty percent. Okay, so what's and what number do we use for the turnover? Well, the software uses two point one four. Okay, so what's two? Let's forget the one four. What's two percent of fifty percent of four hundred thousand? Two hundred. So what's two percent of four hundred thousand? I'm sorry, two hundred thousand, half of four hundred thousand. So four grand. And if they have variable annuities, then we have to tack on what? Unnecessary M&E charges. 
So we're already up to what, guys? And unnecessary fees. What are we already up to? 12 grand. And that's not even talking about M&E charges. That's not even talking about M&E charges. On a $400,000 account, guys, that's, that's $12,000. And we're asking them to pay how much? How much are we asking them to pay in commission? Let's say that we're going to move half of it into half of it into a uh, FIA. So let's say a six percent commission. What's six percent on two hundred thousand? What's six percent of two hundred thousand? Twelve thousand. How long is it going to take them to break even, based on our net savings and in for, and, and our advice? One year. And again, I went through that quickly with you. I'm going to go slower with the client, but they're going to. So, are they? So, are they worried about paying fees? If they're really worried about paying fees, how quickly should they move their money to me? If they're really worried about paying fees, that's right, Artie. Yes, Dale. Immediately. So, if when you get become an expert at the who, what, where, why, and how, the part five objections, are we f totally fine with them giving us an objection? Do you think I'm totally fine with somebody giving me an objection? Because I use every single objection to what? First of all, if you think of a classic sales cycle, if you think of a classic sales cycle, there's two pressure points. There's two places that clients and advisors feel uncomfortable. First one is the close. Because, you know, now push comes to shove. Now we're saying move your money. Our clients generally, in the classic way that people sell, are the, is their blood pressure up or down when, the, when we finally get to the point where we say, let's move the money? Blood pressure up or Okay, that's up. How about the advisors, blood pressure up or down when we finally get to the point where we're asking for the money? Up. See, that's generally a high pressure point. With the 5Q, do we ever ask them to move the money? With the 21-point checklist or the 5Q system, do we ever ask them to move the money? No. They tell us. So is there any pressure there for them? No. Is there any there pressure there for us when you do it the right way? No. Okay, so that's one. Classic sale, selling cycle or classic way that uh, or, um, any salesperson sells are two pressure points. One is the close, and one is where else? Where's the other one? Objections. What happens to their blood pressure when they give you an objection? Goes up. What happens to your blood pressure when they give you an objection? So look at what I've done here using this formula. When I acknowledge, hey, you're you're right. I mean, we wouldn't be want to be giving a, a paying fees for advice to get free, would we? And then I spent three minutes getting on the side. What is happening here? Is blood pressure going up or down? More importantly, they start to what? They start to what? Like me. So I've taken something that should be a pressure point in the classic sales cycle and turned it into what? A rapport building exercise. A rapport building exercise. And do I have any fear once they like me, once, once they know that I know how they think, and I think just the same way, do I have any fear then if I know I have these bottom lines, oops, have these bottom lines, do I have any fear whatsoever of an objection? Or do I know it's going to be just one more uh, way for them to sell themselves on moving? But again, that takes skill to be able to do that on the fly. So I'm not asking you to do that. When you want to get better at that, we do have the tools for you to do that. Like you said, this is 97% of any of the objections you're going to ever come across. And guys, if I was, do you think, uh, I, I am not a genius. This stuff is all here. We have guys and coaching guys for 20 years, we have guys that can do this just as well as me. So do you think me or anybody that knows how to do this would be afraid of overcoming an objection on primetime TV in front of 300 million people when I know these things? If there was one of these objections, and really me, you give me any objection, do you think I'm going to have any problem on primetime TV overcoming those objections? No. Why? Because I'm brilliant? No. Because I have a what? 
I have a what? I have a system to do that. Oops, let me get back here. Does that make sense? So do you now understand why, uh, uh, do you now understand um, that you can easily, easily, easily over uh, t uh, move to the next step if you wanted to? But the biggest question is, do you have to? What I really want you to pull from this is, do you have to uh, be awesome at this? Do you have to be awesome at what I just did there with having them tell me why they should move forward? Artie's got it. Why? No, exactly. Why do I need to be awesome? Because you can do it the same way you always have done it as long as you do what? Do these three things first. Do these three things first. Then you can even say but and over, and then say, can I show you another way of looking at things? And they're going to say, sure, why? Because they like you and they think, well, you've just spent three to five minutes telling me why I'm right. I guess I could spend a minute listening to why you're right. Does that make sense? Does that help you understand that you don't need to worry about turning the corner to use this system or this technique? Awesome. Good. So with this help, with this, so this is three, we've broken up, coming over, overcoming objections in three different coaching calls. And again, though, the best way to overcome objections, somebody gave us earlier, the best way to overcome objections is, is what? I spent three hours teaching you not to have any. That's right. I spent three hours telling you how you can overcome objections. I think it's way easier to just learn the 21 point checklist, learn the FIA presentation. If you, if you, know the 21 point checklist you're not going to get any objections at the second meeting if you know the FIA presentation what's the only if you know the FIA presentation backwards and forwards and the client tells you 100 to 120 times in one hour they want to move their money what's the only objection you're going to get if you know the FIA presentation this is the only one I've ever heard when it's done right this is the only one I've ever heard what's the only objection you're going to get and it's not even an objection. You have to, in fact, you have to give them the objection. They, that's right. Can I put all the money in? They want to put it all there. So you have to actually object to that and say, well, you can't. Because, and then, again, we have ways to overcome that. But that's the biggest objection you have. Because if they spend an hour telling you 110, 120 times they want to move all their money, this is really the only right place to put their money. The biggest objection you have is they want to put it all there. And, of course, we cannot do that. Does that make sense? Good. So was it helpful or redundant to, to break objections into three, uh, three one-hour coaching calls? Is this redundant or are you okay with diving deep occasionally into very specific techniques that we use? Good. Well, then we will spend more time diving deep, uh, not all the time, but spend more time breaking some of our techniques down, sales training down more specifically to help you learn some of these uh, high-level skills and be exposed to them. And guys, even if you're if you're not an expert to this, you just try to use this. How much better will things go? Much. Make sense? So thanks, sir. Thanks for being on. Thanks for paying attention. Th thanks for being willing to to do things differently in a more efficient and effective way. I really appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.